Hello, good evening, welcome. This is Hot Edition. We're live on News Hub at Adesawe Kanda, also live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. We're live on W93.5 in Wa and beyond. Coming up this evening, Attorney General, Minister of Justice, Godfrey Yabu Adame, takes on the Speaker of Parliament, accusing him of doubling in politics in suspending the approval process for ministerial nominees. We have an exclusive with the Attorney General. It's a time that we have to look at things legally and through the appropriate lenses and stop the unnecessary with all respect, tit for tat. That has been done by some people. Well, that's the Attorney General there. He believes the nominated ministers and deputy ministers designate whose approval will not happen anytime soon may consider legal action against Parliament. That's the resolution now or the consideration of the Attorney General. He is resorting to the courts to fight the battle against Parliament. I think that we even have a course of action against, against Parliament, against the, the persons who are, who are contending so. Because if I have been, if I were not a minister and had been nominated for ministerial appointment, what, how justified is it for a person to restrain Parliament from considering my approval simply because he has a case against some other person who, who, who are not in Parliament? Well, that's Godfrey Yabot. I mean, the Attorney General Minister of Justice. There. Stay with us here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Well, the details of that exclusive interview with Godfrey Yabot, I mean, the Attorney General, who is now drawing swords directly at the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumana Kinsford Bagwin, on the decision to, as it were, not pursue the process of approving the minister and deputy minister designates uh, through the parliamentary uh, process of approval. Now, here's what we're getting to know, that in the coming days, it is believed, all things being equal, that the Attorney General is considering a legal action against Parliament. How will that play out? It's a conversation we'll have on hot edition also. The National Labor Commission ordered striking pre-tertiary teachers' unions to immediately call off their industrial strike action. We'll tell you the reactions of the various labor unions and teacher unions to this directive from the National Labor Commission. All these plus the latest in business, sports and entertainment coming up over the next 60 minutes here on Hot Edition on 3 FM 92.7. We're live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. Also on W93.5 in Wa and beyond. Welcome. I am Alfred Okonsa. Let's get into the details now. If you go on our Facebook page at 3 FM 927, we're streaming live on Facebook right now at 3 FM 927 and we'll be posting some of these document I'll be referring to as we go on uh, on the bulletin this evening. Attorney General Godfrey Yabuadame has hit hard uh, the Speaker of Parliament accusing him of doubling in politics. The Speaker last night suspended the approval process for the ministerial nominees. In an exclusive interview with my colleague Joseph Akable, the Attorney General says the nominees should consider legal action against Parliament. We'll bring you the interview shortly, but first, my colleague Dennis Poberi Wadam is joining me in the studio with uh, some aspects of the, uh, the Attorney General's position on this matter. Dennis, the AG is making the case that there was no writ filed seeking to place an injunction on Parliament from proceeding with, with the vetting and approval process of the racial nominees, as the, as the Speaker had claimed last night. Yes, what, what was the basis for this? Well, so th that's right. That's right. Following from what happened yesterday in Parliament, where the Speaker had had reason to respond to the letter from the presidency indicating that Parliament should be um, should not transmit the anti-LGBTQ plus bill to him, and that even if it was transmitted to him, he was not in a position to receive it. Um, I mean, the, the, the speaker said quite a number of things, mm -hmm. um, including to suggest that what the president had done by allowing that letter to be written by his executive secretary was unconstitutional. He had gone outside of his limits to do what he did, and that it was an affront on our democracy. It was in contempt of parliament and all that. Consequently, parliament yesterday um, had to be a giant sunny day, reason being that um, they could not do some of the things they wanted to do last night, including a very key thing that they had to do yesterday, that was the approval of some ministerial nominees and deputy ministerial nominees, mm. which really is the issue in contention now, because um, members of the majority side could not understand why the speaker took that decision. Mm. In fact, they had issued a statement to um, condemn the action of the speaker together with the NDC MPs, and in their view, it was just a conspiracy between the speaker and the NDC MPs to sabotage government business, because um, they could not approve the ministers, and together with some critical bills they see or business of the house that had to be conducted, they couldn't do so. Mm. Now, following from that, the Attorney General decided to 
according to him, that it came to his attention what had happened in Parliament today. And because he has a role under Article 881 to be the principal legal advisor to government, including Parliament, he decided to understand what the issues were at stake. Now, remember the reason for which Parliament did not approve the ministers yesterday, according to the Speaker, was the fact that there was a pending suit against some of the ministerial nominees. Mm. Um, Member of Parliament for the South Dyer constituency, Nelson Dafemako, had gone to court to say that for ministers who were reassigned needed to be also vetted. That's right. But um, they have already done the vetting mm -hmm. for ministers who were taking new places and then new ministerial uh, 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 nominees. nominees. So that matter was already ongoing. Now the speaker says that if President Ekufado says that the bill should not be transmitted because there are two pending lawsuits, including an, an interlocutory injunction, then, going by the same reasoning, then Parliament too should not um, approve the ministers because there was also a pending suit against the ministers. The Attorney General didn't take kindly to that, so he went to court to conduct a search at the Supreme Court registry to find out what exactly the issues are. The results of the search as per the oh, document that we hold have. on to the results of the search and let's just do a quick recall of what the speaker of parliament said really in relation to nelson ross and dafia mcbos suit right honorable members i also bring to your attention the receipt of a process from the courts titled robson nelson h a k dafia mcbos versus versus the speaker of parliament and the Attorney General, suit number J1 slash 12 slash 2024, which process was served on the 19th, that is yesterday, March 2024, and an injunction motion on notice seeking to restrain the Speaker from proceeding with the vetting and approval of the names of the persons submitted by His Excellency the President until the provisions of the Constitution are satisfied. Honorable Members, in the light of this process, the House is unable to continue to consider the nominations of His Excellency the President. <laughs> to use the language of the Attorney General and Minister for Justice, quote, in the spirit of upholding the rule of law, unquote. Until, until after the determination of the application for interlocutory injunction by the Supreme Court. So that's the speaker there, and, and he makes reference to a statement that the Attorney General oftentimes makes um, yes. in, in, in making an argument for and on behalf of government whenever some of these matters come up. And, and, and so the point that you're making, which is what the Attorney General and Minister of Justice, Governor Ibadam, is making, is that the, the process for even the vetting of these ministerial nominees has been ongoing. In fact, it's ended. Yes, it's ended. So the last phase of it yesterday was supposed to be for the entire parliament plenary to, to approve. approve or otherwise. But the Speaker says that once there's a precedent that says that if there's a pending suit, let the courts decide before we go on to the next step. Let's also play by it. But the Attorney General does not agree with that view. So in order to put the issues into perspective, he mm. decided to conduct the search to indeed, first of all, confirm if there was indeed that pending suit. Right. According to the, the search, it shows that so when you are conducting a search, there are specific questions you are asking the court as mm. to where, what processes are before the court. Okay. So one of the key questions that the Attorney General was seeking to satisfy himself with was the fact whether or not a statement of case in support of the plaintiff's rights has to date been filed in accordance with the Supreme Court rules and as to date was uh, just today at 9.05 a.m. early in the morning today. Now the search result shows that only the writ has been filed. This is purely procedural. And now mm. he will come to explain what this search results mean. The other question was whether or not an application for interlocutory injunction has been filed by the plaintiff. And the plaintiff here refers to Nelson Dafemako. Mm. Um, hearing, and if so, when it was filed, the search result showed that it is no. 
no 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 application for interlocutory interlocutory injunction has been filed the third question was whether or not but the speaker at this stage that the, 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 there's an interlocutory injunction application yes in fact he makes the case that there was a pending suit in fact take, take a listen to that, that last part of the speaker's uh, uh, submission in parliament yesterday mentioning the interlocutory injunction and, I, and i'll come at you on that particular point that you have just referred to right. the rule of law unquote until until after the determination of the application for interlocutory injunction by the Supreme Court. So that's the speaker. Right? right. So he made reference to an interlocutory injunction. Mm -hmm. But the record showed, as at 9.05 a.m. this morning, mm -hmm. that there was no interlocutory injunction. I see. Whether or not an application for interlocutory injunction has been, made, has been served on the parties in the suit. And the party should be attorney general himself and then parliament he had to do so because it, it could have been possible that parliament was served but he the attorney general was not, was not saved. saved but the search showed that that wasn't done as at 9 5 a.m that is an interlocutory injunction. injunction okay so 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 basically now having received this search the attorney general now goes ahead to write a letter to parliament like i explained earlier mm -hmm. he said per his rule under article 881 where he's the principal legal officer of the government including being a legal advisor to parliament mm. he was just drawing their attention to some of the things that he had observed so he makes the case that when when he applied for the search yes only a writ had been filed there was no statement of case as required by the the rules of the supreme court and that is procedural it was his view that in such instances it's likely that that suits if the statement of case is not filed within 40, uh, 14 days, they will strike it out. So he was just bringing the, the attention of the House to some of those things. He also makes the case that now this was a suit which was challenging the, 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 the nomination of some ministers, not all of them, I mean ministerial nominees, to suggest that some of them who were new appointees were not caught under the, 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 the case of Nelson Mandela-Femako. Okay. So it would not be fair for parliament- to Put them all together. All together. Okay. So he also make he, he he advises Parliament on that is it advice. Yes, he draws the attention mm. of the House to that particular one. He also says that when he made the check, he did not see any interlocutory injunction specifically being filed. He says that even though there was a relief which looks like restraining Parliament from doing things per the rules of the Supreme Court, if you want to file an interlocutory injunction, it has to be specific and standalone. But that as of the time he was doing the search, he couldn't see any of those things. I see. Together, he's essentially saying that Parliament, if it may, should consider the decision that they took not to uh, approve the ministers because from his standpoint of the law, it does not suggest that the basis for which they took the action that they took yesterday, and in fact, they do not even make it seem like it was the, the decision of the House, but that it was the decision of the Speaker not to let the approval of the ministers happen. And that, in the view of the Attorney General, it is not the right thing to do. You're still live here on Hot Edition on 3 FM 92.7. We're live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and on W93.5 in One Beyond. And the the exclusive interview that we have the Attorney General, Godfrey Badame, expressing concern over the Speaker of Parliament, Alban Sumanakis, for Bagwin's assertion that the House cannot consider the nomination of the new ministers and deputy ministers appointed by President Kufuado due to an injunction at the Supreme Court. And that's what my colleague Dennis Poberi Wadama has been running through the search results of the attorney general at the courts earlier today the, re the courts registry earlier today now if you go on our facebook page right now there are two things happening we're going to put the, the the statement from the attorney general and minister of justice responding to the speaker of parliament and then also we're streaming live in a minute the exclusive interview that we had with the attorney general godfrey yabu adami um, responding to some of the issues that the Speaker of Parliament raised in that voice clip I just played to you, outlining the fact that, as Dennis has clearly established, based on the findings of the search of the registry, there is no interlocutory injunction as the Speaker referred to. So it raises fundamental questions as to, as to what the Speaker was talking about, is it not? I mean, uh, we need to know yes. if uh, Dafia Mepo's suit amounts to an interlocutory injunction but if it was the case the the search at the registry would have known but, would it, have but revealed, it, it, it's it important to also put on record that the timing of the attorney general search that was 9 a.m in the morning mm. almost the beginning of the time that i mean the, the early hours of the courts starting work but thereafter some other processes 
have been filed by the council for Dr. Mako. I see. So there definitely has been a development. But the, but the contention was, is that was, as at the time the speaker was making his statements about the existence of an interlocutory injunction, was there an electoral There was none per the search. That's the argument they are making. Interesting. Now, the majority, to us, I mean minority, they've also been re responding to some of these things. It's quite a fast developing story because mm. the, 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 the majority uh, members of parliament, like I said earlier, are making the case that this whole thing is a conspiracy between the Speaker of Parliament and the MDC MPs to sabotage government business. The minority says that no. What is happening is that the majority members are falling on their own dagger, which mm -hmm. started off on Wednesday. And the right. Wednesday being the letter that was brought to Parliament by the, I mean, from the presidency, written by the Executive Secretary of the President. Mm -hmm. They also go on to make the case that it is not true that the bills that the majority members claim were supposed to have been considered yesterday, one of them in, um, being tax waivers, um, a, tax, a tax waiver. Mm. They said, no, it is not the case because that tax waiver was not th something that was advertised to be taken yesterday in Parliament because they had resisted the tax waiver. Recall the day that the par uh, Parliament passed some 300 million US dollars as part of the World the Bank. World Bank yes. yes. They had to draw the new finance minister's attention to some tax waivers, which they said was a huge amount of money, and that if we got that money, there wouldn't have been the need for us to go for that money again. That's right. The finance minister said they were going to look at the tax waivers. So apparently, it was something that the majority side thought it was going to be considered yesterday. The minority says no, it was not one of the things they were looking at. And that they cannot be blamed for what is happening. So it's, it's, there's a mix of politics, there's a mix of legal gymnastics and all that. It's, 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 it's a story which is developing very thick and fast. And we're keeping eyes on it. Certainly so. And uh, let's hear from the Attorney General, Minister of Justice, in this exclusive interview, my colleague, Joseph Akable. So I thought it was a little bit premature. And of course, as I indicated, funded on false premise for the Speaker to contain that on account of the suit that had been filed by Mr. Ross and Nelson Dafirmapo. Parliament could not proceed with the vetting of the, of the of not proceed with the approval processes when the vetting had already been done. Approval processes of the ministers and deputy ministers who have been nominated by by the the president. I mean, the speaker makes the point that in your advice to the president, you urge the president not to assent to the bill. But in what the secretary wrote to the parliament, they are asking parliament to cease and desist. And the speaker makes the argument that that is more or less telling parliament not to do its work of simply presenting the bill to the president and the president would have to follow the constitutional provisions in that regard. Well, I think um, it's an inference that the secretary to the president made. And of course, one may say you know, reasonably, because my letter set out the full facts and circumstances of the actions that had been filed in the Supreme Court of Gas. I mean, I mean, but they are those who make the argument that, I mean, should Parliament be restrained from doing its work? I mean, if you have given advice, the Parliament's also a party to the action in court. So why not let Parliament do its work and present it, and they will bear the consequences if there should be any contempt process? Well, that's up to them. But at the end, I mean, what, what is the point in actually transmitting a bill whose validity, constitutional validity, has been challenged in the Supreme Court of Ghana? And now we see that on all fronts, on all accord, indeed, Every aspect of this process is political. Every aspect of this bill is politically motivated. Otherwise, there's really no urgency. There's, I remember um, mooting the contract amendment bill by which public officers are prohibited from, from um, charging compound interest as a rate of interest in contract. That's a very important bill. A bill that has to do with the public potential, the public pace, where well, it actually has a tendency to save the state billions of cities in judgment debt. The bill was passed by Parliament in July 2023. It was only brought to the President for his assent about three weeks ago. And the President assented to it only about two weeks ago. So clearly, it tells you that every step that has been taken in, in this matter is politically motivated. And I find it so much um, in bad faith. Politics. Yeah. There are those who also make the point that it appears the president does not simply want to sign it. And in fact, they suspect that he set that process in motion to not sign it when he opted not to sign the uh, anti rich craft bill into law, even though he had previously assented to a private member's but that also had custodial sentence in there to make the point that because it imposed custodial sentence, it means that it places a burden on the consolidated fund. No, I would think that that's actually a very faithful view. And it will interest you to note that before the president decided not to or decided to rescind 
his assent to the um, anti rich capt bill. He actually sought our opinion. He sought the opinion of the officer of the Atejura. And it was the opinion that I delivered after having considered the views of people who are properly trained in legislative drafting. I mean, I mean, some make reference to the e levy bill, for instance, not in terms of the impact on the fund, but the fact that there was a pending case, the president nonetheless signed it into law. No. As far as I, would, I can remember, at no point in time during the pendency of the application at the Supreme Court, application for interim interlocutory injunction at the Supreme Court, did the president take any step at all. All relevant steps were taken after the dismissal of the application for interlocutory injunction. I mean, consistent with the fact that uh, when an interlocutory injunction is filed, it ought to stay proceedings. I mean, we can all agree that it should be put on hold, the, no, the vetting no, of the minister. No, uh, the point is the statement was made yesterday. The statement was made by the speaker at the time that there was no application for interlocutory injunction pending. And the mere statement of such a relief on the rate of summons does not constitute it into an application for inter interlocutory injunction. And I think that it's actually a case where either the speaker was misled or perhaps was just relying on, 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 I think perhaps was, was misled by those who were who, who were mooting the action. Just don't make the point that, I mean, when the president was commenting on the Richard Sky development, it had also not been filed. I did not speculate at all. I mean, I'm, I'm attending you. I do not rely on speculation and, and, and rumors in the media. I am not aware of the specific timelines, the date or the time at which the um, application or the suit was yeah, filed. The time he spoke, the next day, then the sky action was filed. Not in the president in, in, in that situation stated that by virtue of the penance of anticipatory injunction, he was not going to proceed. I don't think he even alluded to anticipatory injunction. He made the point that he was aware his decision was. Uh, before the Supreme Court, as simple as that. It, it is actually the anticipatory injunction application which then led to a consideration as to whether. The president will proceed or not, and that is when I gave the opinion. The president also acted in a manner that we all know it. So clearly, I mean, we, 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 I think we, we must be faithful to the law. We must be faithful to due process, and we must also be very fair to the facts for for approval by parliament. Parliament has, in accordance with its own procedure, vetted them. I mean, he makes the point in the rate that uh, that list is not complete because they've not added the names of the other individuals who have been moved. That. And I, if, if, indeed, if I were those affected, I think that we even have a cause of action against, 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 against Parliament, against the, the persons who are, who are contending so. Because if I have been, if I were not a minister and had been nominated for ministerial appointment, what, how justified is it for a person to restrain Parliament from considering my approval simply because he has a case against some other persons who, who, who are not in Parliament. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that wholly unrelated. And I think this country must be very analytical in the way we, we think and do things. And we must also stop unnecessary politicking. And when that is done, I think the nation will do. That's Godfrey Yabo Adame, Attorney General, Minister of Justice, in that exclusive interview with my colleague Joseph Akable uh, there, uh, giving details of, of a number of the questions that many have been asking uh, after this position by the Speaker of Parliament, Abbas Umanakis Babagman, yesterday. Now, um, uh, we've had so many of you sending us messages on Facebook at 3FM927 on Facebook, and Nana Kwame. I'm sending us a message from Sweden who says, please, what is an interlocutory injunction? Well, guess what? The way my colleague Dennis Pabari Adam will do a quick response to that and then we'll move on to some of you. So, yeah, just, just do well, so, so in, me. In, in the layman's language, when you say an interlocutory injunction, you are simply saying that, okay, you acknowledge that there's, an, there's, a, there's a case in court. Okay. But before we finish the case, stop the other person from doing what he's doing. So in this particular case, you are saying that okay, Parliament intends to transmit a bill from Parliament to the Speaker, um, to the President. Mm. Now that is a matter that the court needs to decide. But before the court decides, stop Parliament from doing whatever it is doing. Mm. So okay. restrain them from doing whatever they are doing. So that's what basically you want the court to do. And that's what we call the interlocutory injunction. It's interlocutory because it's happening in between a main action. Okay. I, I, I just hope that that, that clears the, the uh, air on what uh, an interlocutory injunction is. Certainly, certainly. So uh, that's just for you. Um, Anna Kwame sent out a message from 
Uh, Swedro, thank you very much for that. It's live here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7, also on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. We're live on W93.5 in WA and beyond. Your thoughts, views, comments and opinions are welcome. Keep them coming. And uh, we'll read them out to you and to the rest of the world. And the many, many, many of you who are sharing uh, your, your thoughts on this matter of the Attorney General uh, the response and the reactions to the Speaker of Parliament's position on this. And uh, we, we're monitoring quite closely how things will play out because clearly this is not the end of this this back and forth as, as yet. Lawyer Martin Pebo uh, has been making his point that this is more of a, a tit-for-tat situation. But let's, let's, let's stay a bit further on this. And uh, we have the Member of Parliament for the Bandak constituency, uh, the minority chief whip, uh, Ahmed Ibrahim, joining us on the telephone. Uh, can you hear me? Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us here on Hot Edition. Good evening, Alfred. It's been a while. Yes, indeed. And uh, really do appreciate your time this evening. First off, this is what the Attorney General is saying, that upon his search, as of this morning as at 9, 9.05 a.m., there was no interlocutory injunction by Nelson Roxin Dafian Boy, your colleague and MP for South Dyke constituency. For which reason, the Speaker referred to that interlocutory injunction uh, and declined going ahead with the process of approving the, the ministerial nominees of the, the President. So what, what is the minority's position now on this, now that the, the Attorney General says there was no interlocutory injunction, as per his search? No, that is after his search, but the speaker said there has been an interlocutory intervention. So it is his work against the speaker's word. If the speaker was not certified that there was an interlocutory injunction, I don't think the speaker would have gone that direction. The speaker said there was, and he said that he has searched, and upon his search, there is no such a thing. But who do we take serious? It was the same attorney general who misled the presidency into bringing him into such a ditch. So I don't think we should take whatever he's saying again very serious because he misled the president. Well, essentially, he sees this as more of a, of politics, of tit for tat. You are, uh, it says the speaker indeed, the minority in but parliament. He say, I, but he's saying that there's no tit, there's, there's a tit, but there's no tat. So how can he see it as tit for tat? <laughs> how can you say that it's tit for tat? Clearly speaking, you see, even... The framers of our constitution foresaw that governance arm of government must work together. And even if you look at those, the contractualists who brought about the concept of governance, brought about separation of powers, and at the same time, they brought about checks and balances. So governance, you are governing people. You are not governing trees or robots. And therefore, in taking certain decisions, Everything that you do, you must learn to engage. But if you are being advised by people who don't understand consultation and engagement, this is where they will land you. Where we are now, I don't think that this is the time that the Attorney General would have been looking for who is at fault and who is not at fault, who is at this and who is not at this. They must learn to engage and consult. And that is what will move this nation forward. Because they are governing people. And therefore, when you are governing people, you must learn to understand the people you are governing. You must know their feelings and understand their feelings. And you must learn to be able to communicate with them and carry them along. This is not the time to come and say, throw your weight and who is who and what is what. No, 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 no. I think we must all learn to engage. And that is where we are now. It is not a matter of tit for tat. Well, you know what I mean? If you could just hold on a bit for me, because I have... Uh, private legal practitioner Nick Paposa Mwado, who is the uh, the lawyer for Nelson Rocks and Dafia Mepo. So, uh, uh, counsel, can you hear me? Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us on Hot Edition. Good evening, my brother. It's good good, good to have you. Your listeners and viewers. Indeed. I have the minority chief whip on the other line, Yonobo Ahmed Ibrahim. Uh, he was the one who was just speaking before you. First of all, I want to establish a few things. Has there been an interlocutory injunction filed by Nelson Rocks in Dafia Mepo on the issue of this, the uh, ministers and deputy ministerial nominees uh, vetted by parliament? Yes, there has been an interlocutory injunction filed. What's out today? At what time today? 
10 o'clock. Yeah, what is the issue? At 10 o'clock. Well, the, speak, uh, the, the, the Attorney General has issued a statement and in an interview, yeah, exclusive, statement. you've seen the that's, statement. That, that, that's, the, that's the only reason why I am, I am, I am responding. Let me make this, let me make this point. Uh, the, the writ of Mr. Roxon was filed on the 18th. In the Supreme Court, you are allowed to file your writ, and then within 14 days, you must file your statement of peace. Hello, are you there? I, I can hear you clearly. Okay. So if you read this letter, he raised the point that the rate, yes, was found and had been served on him, and he believes it would have also been served on the speaker. Now, if you look at release 9 and 10, he also makes the point that there were injunctive relief in the rate. He makes that point as well in his letter to the speaker. Yes, indeed. Now, once there are injunctive relief, and the rate is made up, a rate and a statement of case, where you are the high court, the statement of case, they are read together. So when you have the statement of uh, the statement of claim of the or the rate in the Supreme Court, in the, the accompanying document is called the statement of case. And that's why you have 14 days. In the High Court, you have to file it together. But in the Supreme Court, you have 14 days within which to file that. When you file your rate in the Supreme Court and you state your relief, the relief are on the are endorsed on the uh, uh, rate the rate that you have issued. And they indicate to whoever is the uh, recipient the nature of the case you are bringing before the court. And so when you are served with it, it has a legal effect. The speaker is a lawyer of long standing experience. And so when he was served with the rate, with an injunctive relief on it, he clearly knew that he had been put on notice. And that is why when he was speaking, he indicated the fact that he had been served with the rate. And he has been served with the rate. Now, the speaker has interpreted, and I, in my opinion, rightly, that once he has been served with the rate, he will not go ahead to do the very thing that the rate is seeking to prevent him from doing. That is the correct opinion and position of the law. The attorney general might hold a different opinion. Respectfully, that is his opinion. And that is what lawyers we hold. We all hold opinion. You understand? But it is the court that affirms or disapproves of whatever opinions you would have the articulation in the court. We are not in the courtroom, yes. So if the speaker, within the confines of parliament, has received a process from the court and has decided that based on that receipt of the process, he was not going to continue or embark on anything that potentially will put him in conflict. Remember that the speaker himself is a party to the suit. That's what people don't even seem to, to, to take into account, that he is not just speaker of parliament, He's also the first defendant in the suit. So out of caution, if he decides that he's not going to take any step, that may put him in contempt of the court. Is that not a wise and prudent part to take? Rather than going and doing the very things that the race is seeking for you not to do, hey, the speaker being a lawyer of many years standing at the back has decided that he would embark on the path of prudence. And he should be congratulated for being so. And maintaining the sanctity and dignity of parliament. There is no requirement that at the time I'm filing my rate, I should file my injunction application on that very day. No. What the person, what the party, the 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 the, the plaintiff did was he filed a rate with an injunctive relief on it. And so clearly, when the speaker was speaking, he had only been served with the rate, rightly. And that is why the AG in his letter indicates on this an opinion as to what he thinks the legal effect of an injunctive relief on the rate should be. Respectfully. Right, counsel. So so yeah. it's good that you make reference to that aspect of the, the Attorney General's statement. He makes the point that, indeed, whilst it is true that the rate filed by Nelson Rexford and Dafia your client, purports to be an order of interlocutory injunction restraining the Speaker from proceeding with the vetting and approval of the mention nominees, it goes without saying, quote, that the same is not an application for interlocutory injunction and that every 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 i'm coming to a point every application for interlocutory injunction relief in any of the supreme courts as its trait must be by a motion specifically filed and praying for desired but relief is it, is it, the point is this the 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 ag does not control what the speaker does you understand uh -huh. 
when the speaker has received the process, it is for the speaker to decide how he wants to interpret that process. And I'm sure the minority chief will speak to those facts. Those are matters of parliament. For me, what is important is the fact that after the risk has been filed, the speaker has now been said as of today, the injunction application with the statement of case and even the substantive statement of case, which we are entitled to file within 14 days. We are not going to file it immediately. We have 14 whole days to file. But to show that we are very serious with our matter, we filed it within the 14, even before the 14 days are up. So literally, all the matters he raised in his letter have become moot. Have become moot. His, his, his issue, yes, is with the interpretation that the speaker gave by just receiving the rent. But that is within the powers of the speaker. And I'm sure the minority chief will do justice to that issue. You understand? If a speaker exercising his right as a speaker, remember that the speaker was also, or is also a party to the suit. So being a party to the suit, do you want him to take actions and steps that may potentially be in contempt of court? Clearly not. And so I think that when somebody acts and acts prudently, he should be congratulated and not vilified. Well, uh, the, the Honorable Ahmed Ibrahim, that, that, that question to you about uh, this aspect and, and for which reason the Speaker's actions cannot be called into question. I want to find out from you whether the Attorney General is right at any point that the Speaker's position on this matter flies against the position of the law. Interpre in the first place, interpretation of the Constitution or interpretation of law lies within the precept preserve of the Supreme Court. The Speaker doesn't interpret the Constitution, but the Speaker is a senior officer of the other bar, even more senior than the Attorney General. The Speaker asks a simple question. Can an arm of government be injunctive from going about its constitutional mandate, a roadmap which has been given that arm of government by the Constitution? And in that case, can the President be injuncted from as obeying the constitutional dictate where Article 1067 says that this is the process of legislation. And therefore, in the process of legislation, this is what should be done. In the course of doing that, can the executive, and in the, for that matter, the president, be injuncted from going ahead and carrying on that duty? This is a simple question the speaker asks. And this is what the Attorney General should be answering. Then from that, the Speaker said that, okay, if that is what the Attorney General is saying, there is injunction here, there is a writ here, there is a writ here. And somebody is seeking a relief of saying that this House should not proceed to approve. So if that is the, as a matter of upholding the Constitution and rule of law, I will have to lay my hands off from those things until a judgment can come from the court. This is where we are. But I said, procedure in parliament is different from procedure in court. You understand? I see. Proceed, parliamentary procedure is different from court procedure. And court therefore, and if we allow ourselves to be misled by people's opinion, we may get it wrong. The speaker was going ahead by his constitutional mandate. A process had begun, even though the speaker was not in the country. The going ahead, the process of making sure that the ministerial approval and everything happened was in the pipeline. We were just going ahead, and the letter came that this is the advice from the attorney general and this is the action that the president has taken so the speaker was taken aback and said anyway he is the attorney general if he is saying that an arm of governance can be injunctive from going ahead to carry on its constitutional mandate a roadmap that has been stated in the constitution that do a b c d then i have no option than lay my hand washing my hands off on this until a ruling or a judgment comes from the Supreme Court. So nobody should blame the speaker on this. And I think the Attorney General should have been praising the speaker for respecting the rule of law, rather than condemning the speaker. Well, so you see, he says, he says that he, you are seeking to sabotage government business. 
you, the, the, the speaker and the when minority. We, when, when we started in 2021 doing government business, where was the attorney general? Where was he? When we started doing vetting and approving him, where was he? He would have sabotaged somebody. He's the very person who would have sabotaged. But we've been, even when he's absent, we allow his deputies to come and represent him. Then we carry on government business. And I'm surprised he should be the last person to be saying this. John Wamed Ibrahim, I do appreciate your time as always. Thank you so much. John Wamed Ibrahim is uh, the Member of Parliament. Thank for you the... very much, Van Gubera, for calling me. Thank you indeed. He is a Minority Chief Whip, a Member of Parliament for the Banda constituency. Uh, uh, Council, Nick Papo, someone, yeah. can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, great. I, I, I think that, uh, as you indicated, uh, the Honorable Ahmed Ibrahim has, has responded clearly to, yeah, to what... To now, but, but the attorney, you know, maybe finally, before I let you go, he, he, he makes the point, finally, that the mere statement or narrator of summons of a prayer for interlocutory relief is inconsequential and of no effect. Counsel? That, that, is, that is his opinion. We can't fight him over his opinion. It is his opinion. We disagree with that opinion. That is why we are in court. But we won't argue with him over his opinion. He's entitled to his opinion. However erroneous it may be, he's entitled to it. And we wish him well. Council, appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Yeah. Is a member of uh, that uh, is a legal counsel for Nelson Ross in the I'm a member of parliament for the South Dyke constituency. Nick Papo Samuado there. So live here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. Also live on Kiss Me 107.1 in Tamale and beyond. And on W. 93.5 in Wa and beyond, and your thoughts are welcome. Many of you are sending us messages on Facebook on this matter. Uh, I take notice of them as well as we, we, we go through here on Hot Edition on 3FM 92.7. And um, the National Labor Commission has ordered the three pre tertiary unions embarking on an industrial strike action to call off they strike immediately. The Ghana National Association of Teachers, the National Association of Graduate Teachers, NAGRAT, and the Coalition of Consent Teachers on Wednesday, March 20, declared an industrial strike, citing failure of the Ministry of Education and its implementing agency, the Ghana Education Service, to address matters relating to conditions of service. Other grievances include the absence of an appropriate scheme of service and the collective agreement, rampant changes in, in school calendar without recourse to, to the teachers, inefficient distribution of laptops and the freeze of teachers' salaries. Already, the industrial action has started biting as classrooms across several public business schools were abandoned with pupils uh, seen loitering without supervision. Some of them spoke to our reporters earlier today. When we came to school, we didn't see any teacher. We only saw a few teachers. But we had some students saying that the teachers went for strike. So they haven't taught you since you came to school today? Yes, but some of, they let some of the JHS students came to our class and control us. Today I, I went to the school to come and learn, but the, our teachers didn't come because they go to strike. I want to learn, but my teachers go to strike because the government didn't pay their fees and their money. Because so that's what's happening in a number of the public basic schools across the country. Uh, let's get into business now. And Juliana Menuafo is here with, with business. But before we go to the business news, we're getting information that the National Council of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwife Association has served notice of the series of activities to register their displeasure over the recent increment in the cost of verification fees for nurses. Parliament announced a new cost of foreign verification from an initial 550 Ghana cities to staggering 3,000 Ghana cities, representing 445.5% increment. Now, calls for the Health Ministry and the Nurses and Midwives Council to review the costs have proven futile. The leadership of the nurses has therefore outlined actions to be undertaken from March 22, that's tomorrow, to April 3. To register their displeasure and they're saying they're going to drape health facilities in red and they'll eventually end in withdrawing their outpatient services over this 445 percent increment in the cost of these foreign verification forms that's business now after this quick break stay with us here on hot edition
Get ready for an epic adventure. Join TV3 on a two-day expedition of the Western Wonders of Ghana as part of the Ghana Month celebration happening from Friday 29th to Saturday 30th of March. This is Journey to the West. Explore the rich history of Cape Coast Castle. Walk through the lush forest of Kaku. Witness the breathtaking insulated still village for a journey through time. Immerse yourself in the magic of bonfires, groove to sensational music performances and experience the beats with DJs on rotation, indulging mouth-watering dishes and refreshing drinks while creating unforgettable memories. Don't miss the chance to celebrate Ghana's beauty and culture. Join us for two days filled with adventure, culture, and a whole lot of fun. Journey to the West. To book a seat for this Odyssey, call 0264 932732. It's Journey to the West. Hashtag Ghana Month Celebration. Hashtag Journey to the West. Hashtag Explore Ghana. To you by Malta Guinness. 3 FM 92.7. Urban Lifestyle Radio Station. Good evening and welcome to the Business News on Hot Edition. Coming up this evening, Bank of Ghana announces near eradication of counterfeits in cash supply chain. My name is Minua Fou. We have details of these and more lined up for you. Stay with me. And now straight off first story, the Bank of Ghana has revealed that its clean notes policy has rid the economy of counterfeits within its cash supply chain. According to the central bank, there are only seven counterfeits per a million banknotes in circulation. Speaking at a media tour of the Currency Processing Center, head of Currency Management Department as the central bank, Dominic Ousu, touted the country as being among few others to have achieved this feat. In Ghana, counterfeit have never become a problem. Internationally, for you to do anything about banknotes in circulation, the counterfeits must get to a level of about 100 pieces per million banknotes. So we say 100 per mil. In Ghana, we are far below that level. So counterfeit is not a problem in Ghana. We are now somewhere around seven banknotes per million. And that is far below. We are one of the few countries with counterfeit at this level. And if you look at the graph and you look at the trend, you see that counterfeits are, it's almost tapering to level zero. Head of Currency Management Department at the Bank of Ghana, Dominic Usu there. Away from that, results from wave four of the Ghana business tracker by the Ghana Statistical Service indicates a high level of sales vulnerability in spite of the fact that most firms have recovered from the COVID-19 pandemic. Formal sector firms outperformed informal sector ones, experiencing over twice the increase in sales in 2022 compared to 2021. The previous we've uh, highlighted that most of the firms were recovering. That's the wave three. Most of the firms reopened at the time and sales was slowly improving. From the wave, four of the Ghana business tracker, a significant number of firms experienced challenges, including 64% saying inflation is the major hurdle. 54% think high taxes is the challenge and 45% of firms see CD depreciation as huge burden. Firms with European Union links have been more resilient in their performance with increase in sales by 22%. There's a need for us to look at how we can build the capacities of local businesses so that they can compete and be globally uh, uh, strong to help our economy to revamp. Uh, we are ready to adapt green technologies, but the capacity is not there, the financing is not there. The share of firms reporting that the hired workers or laid off workers increased compared to the previous survey, with 5% of firms indicating 
hiring an 8% of firms indicating layoffs. As small and medium enterprises, we need to engage and work together to build stronger collaboration and also for them to use digital tools if they want to expand and grow their businesses. So my advice is that as much as possible, if we can go digital, yes, we should take advantage of it and benefit from it and grow our businesses using these tools. The Ghana Business Tracker Survey was conducted between April 29 and July 9, 2023 by the Ghana Statistical Service with a collaboration with the World Bank, European Union and the United Nations Development Programme. Well, now that brings us to the end of the Business News on Hot Edition. For more business stories, kindly log on to our website on 3news.com. My name is Menu Afo. Bill is on standby with the Sports News Station. Good evening and welcome to the sports segment here on the 3FM Hot Edition. My name is Billy Shen. Let's start from the 2023 African Games because Joseph Paul Amwa has reached the final of the 200 meter after re finishing first in the semis with a time of 20.93 seconds. Ibrahim Fuseni also reached the final after placing second with a time of 21.03 seconds. Solomon Hammond did not make the cut. In the women's division, Janet Mensah reached the final of the 200 meters after finishing second with a time of 23.83 seconds. In boxing, four boxers in Ghana's amateur boxing team, the Black Bombers, are set to compete, to compete for places in the finals of their respective weight classes tonight at the Bukum Boxing Arena. The fighters are Theophilus Alote, Mohamed Amadou, Samotechi, and Abubakar Kamuku. Coach of the Black Bombers' daughter, Ophoria Sari, is looking to get as many boxes as possible to the final. Yeah, that has been our determination. That it has been a long time that Ghana uh, gets gold at the uh, African Games. So we are determined. It's good that we have majority of our boxes into the medal zone now. So the next step is we climb maybe to the silver. And then with those. Uh, 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 no matter to get to uh, the silver level, then we look for gold. Indeed, we will look for gold, according to Dr. Ofori Asari. It is a big game for the Black Princesses. They will face Nigeria's under-20 women's team in the final of the 2023 African Games at 8 p.m. tonight in Cape Coast. A victory will crown a fantastic past 12 months for the young women who secured places in the under-20 women's World Cup. Head coach Risi Basigi had this to say ahead of the game. Nigeria, yes. You know, when it comes to Ghana, Nigeria, off the pitch, we are the best friends, we are the best brothers and sisters. And when it comes to the game proper, uh, it's a different ball game altogether. Yes, um, we want them play, they also watch us play, and Nigeria would not like to lose to us for the second time running. And we also want to consolidate our dominance. So it's going to be a cracker. I know it's going to be a very tough game. So I think that at the end of the day, oh, we shall see what happens. <laughs> We shall see what happens, according to the head coach of the Black Princesses, you see Basigi. In our final story, Ivory Coast-born midfielder Mohamed Diomande has rejected a call-up to the Black Stars ahead of friendlies against Nigeria and Uganda. Oreko Ampofo has all the details. Flight tickets were booked. Mohamed Diomande was supposed to arrive in the Black Stars camp in Marrakesh, Morocco, on Thursday for the friendlies against Nigeria and Uganda. Unfortunately, the midfielder rejected the call-up and has communicated with Otuado that he would require more time to make a decision on his international future. Diomande grew up in Yopugong, a suburb in Abidjan, and is Ivorian by birth. 
uh, but the Ghana Football Association are trying to convince him to play for the Black Stars uh, because he does tick that naturalization box when it comes to residing in Ghana for at least five years. Diomande grew up in the Right to Dream Academy here in Ghana and lived here for seven years, and so he's eligible to play for the country. After playing for Right to Dream, he moved on to Nodgerland where he caught the eye and recently moved to Rangers in the Scottish League where he has continued to impress. Diomande, in his early part of his career, played as a number six, as a holding midfielder, but is now playing as a box-to-box -box midfielder and has been described as a physically strong midfielder who can dribble and also has an eye for goal. Despite being just 22 years, you get the feeling that time may not necessarily be on Diomande's side when it comes to deciding his international future. In this same international window, he was also called by the Ivory Coast under-23 side. And what we're hearing now is that the Ivory Coast Federation are trying to convince the player, given that Ghana are moving for him. Would Diomande play for Ivory Coast or Ghana? That's one thing that time would definitely tell. It is one thing that time will definitely tell. Ghana will be facing Nigeria in the friendly at 1 p.m. on Friday. That brings an end to the sports segment here on the 3FM Hot Edition. Of course, Alfred has more. Thank you, Bill. Thank you so much. And the National Labor Commission has described the strike by the three pre-tertiary teacher unions as illegal. And they've summoned the leadership of the teacher unions to appear before it on Tuesday, March 26. The executive director of the Commission of Fosu Asamoah spoke exclusively with our labor correspondent, Daniel Opoku, earlier today. Flight tickets were... Find more on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com for some more details of this particular story. And then also remember to make a date at 10 p.m. with me and the rest of the team on Ghana Tonight. My name is Alfred Akansi. The drive continues with Giovanni and the team. Do have a great evening.